I see you're moving your lips over there, but I don't hear anything. I'm saying a tongue twister under my breath. Really? Share it with me. Rubber baby buggy bumpers. Say (laughs) that three times. Okay, I'm going to say it once. Rubber baby buggy bumpers. That's good. (laughs) It makes me giggle. You know what? It really helps (laughs) me with B words. Good. It should help me too. So remember rubber baby buggy bumpers. (laughs) Okay. And say it fast. Hi, everyone, and here we are celebrating what people love to do creatively by giving them a voice. I'm Rod Jones. And I'm Angie Jones. Welcome to the Thought Row podcast. We invite you to subscribe wherever you listen, and we're available virtually anywhere you listen to podcasts. And also, you can check us out at thoughtrowpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Don't be yeah. shy. You know, you can always leave us. And for, I mean, a question on our contact page, right? On the, yeah, on the contact form, podcast absolutely. website. Yeah, absolutely. We would love to hear from you. And that's why this show is called Thought Row Podcast, because we want to hear your thoughts. Well, speaking of thoughts. Yeah. How about your thoughtful quote? Hey, you made that work. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. Okay, here is my quote for today. The alchemy of good curating amounts to this. Sometimes placing one work of art near another makes the other one. It's like one plus one equals three. Two artworks arranged alchemically leave each intact, transform both and create a third thing. And that is by our friend Jerry Saltz. Oh, yes. Jerry Saltz, the yes. uh, art critic for the New York Times. Yes, absolutely. And actually, he's got a lot of quotes. But then again, he's been in this industry for a long time. He does. And he's seen a lot and he's experienced a lot. So I bet he t- he, he does have a lot of quotes. He sure. has a lot to say. But you know what I especially like about this one is because, you know, you and I have been to a lot of art museums. Yeah. And I know curators will lay the paintings out to kind of create a flow through a True. museum so mm-hmm. they can move the people through and you go from one painting to another painting to another painting. But I've noticed that just basically like what Jerry Saul said here right. is you'll see a weaker painting and it might be positioned between two very strong paintings. And then all of a sudden you're more attracted to the weaker painting. It just brings something out in it. Mm-hmm. And who's really to say one painting is better than yeah, another painting? Yeah, you really painting? can't because it resonates with people differently. And sometimes maybe a more quiet, quote, quiet painting is not really very quiet at all. Well, it's always subject to people's interpretation, their life experiences, what they like. You know, some person may like uh, flower scenes and other person maybe lean towards a strong abstract Right. It's what resonates with you. And sometimes you're surprised about what you might enjoy, too, and what 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 resonates with you on that day as well. It'd be interesting to see an abstract between two floral arrangements and see how people gravitate to that. Yeah, that would be really an interesting take on having a floral and then abstracts around it. And the other thing cool. that I, I read about and heard about was George O'Keefe when they would lay out her shows. She was always there and she they set everything up along the wall mm-hmm. and then she'd walk around and she'd move things around and sometimes for several hours. And then sometimes she would say, look, we're going to do this again tomorrow. And she'd come back and move her paintings around even more. And then it was very frustrating for the museum staff and the mm-hmm. curators and all that. But she had a way that she wanted to keep the harmony between each piece of her art. And that makes sense that she would do that. Plus, she knew her art better than anybody. Exactly. But also it was how she wanted her artwork to be presented and the the feel and the the mood, the impressions she wanted to leave with people that were viewing it well you you literally can tell a story especially if it's a solo art exhibition Mm -hmm. from one painting to the next you can tell a story or how you know sometimes they start out with the earliest paintings and end up with the latest paintings 
And right. then everybody walks around and go, well, I really liked what he did in the beginning. <laughs> I, I hate what he's doing now or she's doing now. Really well, sometimes, funny. sometimes that does happen, yep. but it's kind of cool when, when you can see the whole body of work as well. Yeah. But now it's going to be your turn, Rod. We are ready for Rod's motivational moment. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, here it is. It's actually a quote that I came up with in response to something. I don't remember even what it was. Okay. But here it is. The soul reveals beauty that the eyes cannot see, but the heart can hear. That's absolutely beautiful. And so tell us about that a little. Well, I don't, I mean, I get the impression, you know, it works for me anyway. I think I feel something about something that I see creatively. Right. I feel it deep inside. And then later my brain has to take over and process it. Right. So I think the soul actually reveals or sees beauty first before your brain tunes into it. And that's why I say, but the heart can hear because your heart hears it. In my opinion, I, you feel it in your heart and then all of a sudden it manages to percolate its way up to your brain. And then once it gets there, then the opinions start and experiences that you've had mm -hmm. in past life mm -hmm. or whatever, all of a sudden start to take over what you felt deep down inside. Right. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that in our very busy modern society, sometimes that sort of gets a little overrun by maybe visuals or what's in or what's not in and what society thinks is cool or not. So it's kind of, if you can keep it at a soul level and your spiritual level, probably you, you will get more out of what you're feeling and looking at. I like that. I think you interpreted my quote probably better than I do. <laughs> I don't know about that, no, but I, I liked I, what you said. I thought that was really profound. Yeah, but I also think that your comment about being bombarded, you know, being basically told how to think. Yeah, you're being told. And it's acceptable and what's not. Right. And yeah. if you, we've mentioned this before, if you listen to that still small voice inside you, uh, maybe it's going to reveal the beauty that is actually there and your eyes can't see it, but your heart can hear it. Right. And your spirit can hear it. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm also often curious what creativity can teach us. Good point. You know, and I, I have to say that on a recent post that I made, I was really, really reticent about posting this particular painting. Oh, yes. I remember. Right. Yeah. It, it was just, it was very agonizing because I felt very, like it was unfinished or something wasn't right with it. Or I don't want to say insecure because that sounds so like uh, you want accolades from others. It wasn't that kind of insecurity. It was more of like, I don't know if anybody will really, it will resonate with anyone. And I don't know if it resonated with myself. So it was kind of like, I wanted to make sure that people were having an experience viewing this painting. And I didn't feel confident in that. And what was interesting is what it taught me when I actually did post it because you convinced me that I should. Yeah, and absolutely. I think it would have been a waste for you not to. Mm -hmm. And I saw that painting hanging around your studio for a while. Yeah. And on more than one occasion, I say, are you ever going to post that? Right. And you not too positive about it or you were thinking that, oh, well, I don't know, maybe I can do something better. Right. I don't think there's an artist in the world. I don't care if you're a composer or a musician or in the theater, True. you always think you can do a better job. You, nobody's ever satisfied. Absolutely. But, but well, in yeah. this case. In this case, it did turn out to be a good thing because once I posted it, I felt a very freeing experience about it. And also it taught me that, you know, you don't necessarily have to fit in the confines of being good or bad. It's more about your creative expression. And I think that's the part that really was very inspiring for me and, and a learning tool for me. What I thought was interesting is you, it uh, garnered a lot of response. Yeah, which people, I was really people surprised. People made a lot of interesting comments uh -huh. and uh, the comments themselves were revealing about the piece of art. I, you know, everybody liked it. I don't think they were all being, they weren't just being polite. I honestly think they liked it, right. but it also triggered 
something in your own imagination that when you do create a piece of art, most artists are never really truly satisfied right, with it. No. They always think that they can do something better. I had a friend of mine several years ago that always used to say, the problem with art is no artist ever thinks it's finished. And he always wants to go over and add one more brush stroke. That's true. And the thing about this this piece that's really made me feel super happy about it, and I know that others really enjoyed it this way, is the conversation. Yeah, I think that part of it, was the most enlightening. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of conversation, we talk to a lot of people on this podcast about creativity, as you know, right. and our listeners know. And the common theme I see is that they're really passionate about what they do. Yeah. I think that's really true. But I also think about, I think about being inspired like you have to be inspired to be passionate because of your creative drive. So it kind of, it's like the Lego blocks of creativity when you have all that. Yeah, sure. And and inspiration, inspiration comes from a lot of different sources, but it's kind of interesting to know or figure out, is there a bridge between being inspired and where a passion starts? Mm-hmm. Exactly. I don't exactly know what that is, but I think you can be inspired to build or create something, mm -hmm. uh, compose a great symphony, whatever, write a book. You're inspired to write a book. But as you get into writing that book, all of a sudden your passions hopefully take over. And that's what makes it turn out to be such an incredible piece. Right. So true. So true. And I think you have to check it in your brain though to make sure that you're not just doing it for motivation to get the end result instead of being inspired and having passion and having the creative drive well one of the things before we move on here yeah. one of the things i want to say is a lot of times you're inspired because you think you're going to look good or are you going to make a lot of money or people are going to be really impressed by what you're doing. Yeah. Wrong but, and yeah, wrong and wrong. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. You, re you really have yeah. to have passion about something that you're doing creatively. And if you get the accolades, that's fine. And if you don't, that's fine too, yeah, right. because it's the experience that you personally have inside is the most important thing, I believe. So true. And while we're on the subject of, being in having inspired life or yeah. being inspired yeah uh let's bring on our guest okay so today we're going to be speaking with 16 crutchfield <music> 16 welcome to the thought road podcast we're really very excited to have a conversation with you uh, regarding your career in the art world. It's just great to have you with us today. Yes. Hi, 16. I agree. And we are so excited to hear about your latest project as well. Hi, Inchi. Hi, Rob. Thank you very much for having me. It's a great honor to be with you guys today. Oh, well, thank it's you. an honor for us, yes. I have to say. So, okay, we're going to start out our interview by asking you, what did you have for breakfast? Well, I'm not very good at breakfast. I know it's the main meal of the day, but um, I usually have a big mug of fresh home ground coffee uh, brewed and a bit of milk and a banana. Oh, that's good. That's healthy. <laughs> that's hey, it's healthy. As long as you get a little caffeine and fruit, you're and, good. It's a potassium for the banana. Yeah, exactly. it's, it's interesting how many people love this question, 16. Mm -hmm. Every time they go, God, I just love that question because people eat fascinating yeah, the fascinating breakfast is anywhere from a plain cup of coffee to something more complicated yeah but anyway i want to get to your name 16 it's a kind of a pretty name it's a very beautiful name actually yeah. and and it's unusual i have to say that very. tell us the story behind it well i have my dad to thank for that obviously i had no input whatsoever <laughs> at the time but um i was born in the 60s in europe at the time there was a lot of American music going on. And so my dad was all into the rock and roll and the Elvis Presleys and all that. 
And uh, when I was born, he wanted to call me 16, as in sweet 16 with the double E-N. Uh -huh. But in those days, when you went to church for to get christened, there, there was a list of names that you could have. And you couldn't sort of, you know, the priest would allow you to name your baby this or that mm. name and not another. So they said, well, 16 wasn't on, obviously. It wasn't an, a Christian name as such. And so uh, he said, well, yes, it is. There's the Sistine Chapel. So, and in French, the Sistine Chapel spells S-I-X-T-I-N-E. Oh, so okay. it became there 16. There you go. Big priest couldn't say <laughs> And um, so, but it's been a great name. I love it. I mean, it's the best door opener that uh, anywhere. And I've mainly been, I mean, I've uh, been a lot in the Anglo-Saxon world, whether in Australia and Europe in England, or I was in an English boarding school for a while. So, um, yeah, everybody always questions my but name. But they remember it for oh, sure. Gosh, they yeah. remember you and your name. It's called, it's called branding. It's yeah. called branding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Un involuntary, yeah, branding, involuntary branding. But I, have a, <laughs> I love it. I have a nickname in Miami because I've I've been to Art Basel, Miami, many many times, and um, there's a very good friend of mine over there who's Cuban. His name is Eddie, and he calls me Thirteen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Okay, <laughs> so I before we go on to the different projects you've managed and talk about them. We know that you lived, you live in Geneva, Switzerland currently, which is gorgeous. But where are you originally from? And when we talked initially on the phone, you had mentioned you spent some time living in Australia. Share with us your journey. Yeah, I have. I was born in Switzerland. I was actually born in Basel, which is in the German speaking part of Switzerland. And then my parents moved to Geneva when I was about three or four. My dad's Swiss, my mom's German. And I was sent to an English boarding school because it was like, it's a family tradition and my mom's family, everybody was sent to boarding school. So that was that. So that's where I learned my English from the age of 10 to 17. Um, and then, so I've been like working and doing all my studies, but also working later, always in English or more in English than in French, even though French is my mother tongue, I should say. And um, yeah, I ended up going to Australia with the Picasso, the Marina Picasso collection. And that was in 1984. And then I went, I loved it. I, I mean, I was there for 10 days and it was all work, 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 but I really wanted to go back there. So 1988 was the bicentennial for Australia. And the people who had organized the uh, Marina Picasso exhibition asked me if I want, well, I had asked them if there was ever a job for me in Australia that I could come and travel a little bit. I'd be delighted. Yeah. So they asked me for the bicentennial and I ended up going there. I was supposed to go there for a couple of weeks and I stayed 11 years. Oh, <laughs> boy. Oh, wow. That's but a long I, time. I did. I, did I married an Australian. So that was part of the 11 years. But always having been in the art world, I ended up, uh, we were in Darwin at the time because my husband worked for a company which was providing material for the mine mining industry. Mm -hmm. So up in Darwin, there's 70,000 people, 90% of them are Aboriginal people. And um, I ended up with the art world. There's not much, I mean, there's a very, very good museum up there. And then there's the Australia Council, which is like the Ministry of Culture, if you like. And um, I loved it. So I got a job there and we worked for the theater, which was called Brown's Marks Community Theater. And as I said, 90% of the population is Aboriginal. So all of the projects, the cultural projects, whether it be theater, dance, music, or fine arts, or even uh, poetry and literature, is usually Australian, I mean, Ab mm -hmm. yeah, Australian indigenous mm -hmm. culture, which is great because that way, when I stayed in, we stayed in Darwin for three years. And when I stayed there, I, I didn't get homesick because I had, it was just so different. Sometimes I'd go to the office and my boss, a guy called uh, Ken Conway, he would say, okay, we're taking the plane today and we're going to Maninguida, which is like a, you know, three forty five minute flight even, you know, n along the, the, the North coast of Australia. 
So, you know, that could have never happened to me in Europe. So me coming from a gallery where we looked at Picasso and modern art and all of a sudden I was doing bar paintings and dot paintings and dreamings and it was just fabulous. I loved it. Well, you know, that kind of leads me to my next question, and that is most everything that you've done in your business career has been related to art in one way or another. Share with us and our listeners how that came about and when you first got excited or interested in creativity in the art world. Well, probably it starts because I'm lazy at heart. I, uh, When I was at boarding school, it was a system. It was an English boarding school, and it was called O-Levels and A-Levels. So you did your O-Levels when you were about 15, and you do about anywhere between 11 and and say 14, 15 subjects. And then after that, you do your A-levels and you pick three, max four. And so um, I was pretty good at art and my art teacher, our art teacher loved, liked me or, or sort of, you know, I was pet teacher a little bit. And so um, I did my art O-level and I did okay. And then I did my art A-level only because it seemed easier to, to do than biology or geography or physics or chemistry. So in my A levels, I took in an Eng- remember I'm in an English boarding school, so I took French and German because they were languages I already knew. And then I took art, and then my history of art teacher pushed me. She said, "Do your A level history of art as well." So I I ended up doing both, and that was probably the the actual subject where I had to learn the most or work well, the so hardest. Well, so in those art classes, but, were you actually painting and yeah, rendering and art. drawing? Yes, I was. Yeah. And uh, I didn't, I, lo- I still do draw a bit. I love anything on paper, whether it's watercolor or um, pencil, but I've never actually professionally practiced art. I've always been on the business side or on the admin side or on the logistics side, but I've never, I'm not an artist by any means. Like you guys, I'm very jealous. <laughs> well, you know, being on the business side is extremely yes. creative. In fact, probably more so well, than pushing, pushing paint around brush, the canvas. Yeah. yeah. You certainly use more parts of your brain. Mm. And then, so I continued that with, you know, from my A-levels, I then went to university. And again, I I was in Denver, Colorado, and I did bachelors of mass communications. And there we had to choose then minors. And so I did history of the theater and history mm-hmm. of art and just continued on. I, I um, thought I was going to be on stage, but no, that didn't happen. And I'm glad it didn't. And um, yeah, so I just continued with History of Art. And then I went on, I came back to Geneva and uh, got my first job as being a you know, gallery assistant. But it was Galerie Yann Crugier, which is one of the top, was at the time, one of the top galleries, top 10, I'd say, in the world. We represented Marina Picasso collection, but also other, we had a lot of, I mean, it was like working in a museum. It was just unbelievable. And so in a way, it was lucky that I landed my first job there. But in another way, you become a little bit blasé. So um, to find, to change from that and to sort of in Geneva, other than Jan Crugier, there wasn't much going on, still isn't much going on. Then that's what, that's also what pushed me to sort of become independent because any other job in Geneva wasn't going to cut it. No, I wouldn't think so. Yeah, it sounds like you got a little spoiled because it was just like such a a, a vibrant environment and to be level. in and high level, yeah. And high level, yeah, it was. And also like you have to remember I'm just graduated so I've got I've you know I'm 22 years old and we were doing this Picasso itinerary show which took me to Australia. In those days the insurance companies insisted on a convoyer on the plane with the paintings. So and that was always sort of the youngest or the assistant so that was me. And so, you know, I flew to the States, I flew to Germany and Japan and Italy, and it was just great. And I thought, oh, I like the working environment. Yeah, that's <laughs> nice. It's, yeah, it's the, very nice. the babysitting yeah. job. Yes. Yeah. Very nice. And I mean, nothing ever happened, thank yeah, God. Sure. So, you know, like it was easy going. Yeah. True. I had one funny experiment. This was in Australia, 1984. When you arrive in Australia, I don't know if you know, they spray you. Again, you know, it's an island, so they protect each other, you know, themselves from any sort of disease and yeah. whatever. Right now with COVID, they're under complete lockdown. Yeah. But in 1984, so they would spray the cabin, but then they don't and they still don't allow any wood inside. And I'm arriving with two or three palletfuls of Picassos, of course, in wooden sure. crates. So they're modern wood. So they were, had been treated. And framed, right? And framed in wood. And framed. Yeah. 
and also um, stretched on wood. And, you know, and that wood is, well, Picasso's age. So um, they were going to spray the paintings. And I said, there's just no way you're spraying anything on any of these works of art. It was very, it took me a long time to get through customs. They had to get all sorts of special authorizations because there was just no way. I didn't know what they were spraying and I wasn't going to let them spray any of my no, artwork. Of course not. Yeah. So that was probably the only time where I had to exercise some authority as a convoyer of the paintings. That's probably the first time they actually had to face it too. And now they probably have a protocol for it. That's very true. Probably around the yeah, world probably. because in China they spray everything too. So. I mean, there's other countries that do are they? starting to do that. So maybe there's a protocol specifically for that because paintings, are, like you said, they're stretched on wood in most cases. Yeah, and you can't you can't yeah. spray a solvent that's aerosol on on things that well, might damage. Too, it yeah. might damage it. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I wasn't going to take that risk, especially not on my you know first sort of job and 22 years old. There's no way I was going to do that. So. Oh gosh, no, no. no. heavens no. no. And also, the some of the stretchers had holes, like you know, like worm. But obviously, they've been treated in Europe or whatever. I mean, the, you know, there was no more worms in the thing. But the, for, to the Australians, it's like, you know, this is bad wood. And I said, well, no, it's not. Yeah, for sure. It's just old wood. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. just <laughs> aged wood at this well, I, point. I know Angie has a question for you. Yeah, I was going to ask, art management seems to be a prevalent theme in your current projects. Could you let us know more about that? Yeah, your art management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about... 15 years ago, I became independent. I, I was working for a company that was organizing art fairs. About, yeah, about 15 years ago, I became independent. And there's a lot of things called art advisory, who are people who, who know about history of art and who advise collectors or pension funds or banking uh, bankers or anybody who buys art, what to buy and why, etc. And follow, if you like, the leitmotif of each collection. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I can do that. But I also think that a lot of collectors don't take the time to put a proper inventory together to, um, you know, photograph their works, to get proper insurance, to get proper condition reports. They don't do all that sort of documentation that should be with any sort of painting. And depending where they get the painting from, there's not, you know, the provenance is not always clear or the bibliography, et cetera. And I found that when people came to me to say, I want to buy a painting or I want to sell a painting, we wasted a lot of time putting everything together to make sure the value, the evaluation of the painting was correct. Because if the provenance is not complete or if, you know, the condition report is not well done or whatever, it plays on the value of the piece. And I thought instead of having collectors come to me and then spending two years trying to get all the paperwork together so that we can sell it at the right price, I would offer p collectors the, to maintain or to put their work, their paperwork in order so that when they sell, they can do it straight away. Very good. Yeah, that's very good advice. Yeah. And so, and that's what I was doing. So rather than being an art advisor, which of course I'm happy to do if somebody asks mm -hmm. me to, you know, I, I very often take collectors around at Basel or whatever, and, and then we walk together and we talk about what they need and what they want and, you know, what excites them, et cetera. And I do that on a regular basis, but I also follow through with a lot of clients and just make sure the inventory is all correct. Usually the clients who have you know, who use my services will have big collections. Like I worked on the uh, UCCA collection, which belonged to Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Ulens, Belgium collectors. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I did the same work at Galerie Crugier with the Picasso collection, but also Torres Garcia. Usually they're bigger collections. I worked on a Cuban collection as well, which was very interesting with Cuban artists from the 40s. So it's a lot of bookworm work, actually, and then just... Um, research and all of that, which I like doing. That falls under the category of art consulting, I guess. And if so, yeah. you know, what have been your greatest challenges and your successes for you personally in that area? What I find really gratifying is that when you do the work and then you have a show or you put pieces up in a foundation because it's a private collection starting a foundation and you hang them and you get in a good result, you get good comments from the press and good comments from the public. And that I find really gratifying because it means you've done a good job and the collection is complete and it's well set up and hung, etc. 
The other thing I, I, I find very gratifying is when you estimate the work and then you take it to Sotheby's or Christie's or whatever auction house and it does well and it's within the parameters that you had set in the first place. So whenever you're not wrong, basically, it's kind of a nice feeling. I can imagine. I bet it is. But you're, you're providing a tremendous service for both the collector and people that want to view the collections. People right. that have an opportunity to actually yeah. see the collection, which is pretty important because a lot of art is held privately and doesn't always see the light of day. And a lot of people don't have the opportunity to see some of these special pieces that have been collected over the years. Yeah. But what's also what's nice is that usually, even if they're kept privately, I've had ish, you know opportunities like that just to create a catalog for that collection, which is going to be held by the collector. But at the end of the day, when you've got the finished product and it's printed and that person says, oh, well, you know what? I showed it to my insurance and they were really happy because it was just such an easy document to work with. That sort of thing, I think, is is also rewarding. Sometimes it takes time because, um, you know, I get, I mean, I have mandates and I get paid by the hour and people don't understand that it takes that amount oh, of sure. time because there's just too much background to work on. But um, I've not had any, any bad experiences as such. I mean, I've given conferences as well. I do. One thing I'm a little bit disappointed with is that I've had a short stint in a private bank, and I was doing the art advisory there, and we were we had this little department or section for very ultra high net worth people, and um, the the customers or the clients were super happy, but the sometimes the bankers I tried to then on my own offer that service to mm, different right. bankers, and the, and a lot of the Swiss banks are not they're not reacting yet; they haven't quite yet understood the the importance of art and how they can improve their own banking service and financial advisory if they knew a little bit more or if they had a service with art. I always say the client, whether he's an investor in a bank, if he, you know, if he has a passion, it can be art, but it also can, it can be vintage or a vintage cars or a wine or whatever it is. But if your financial advisor knows about your passion and can actually exchange with you on the subject, it it just, it makes all the difference. Oh, I'm sure. Well, sure. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, what were you going to say, Angie? You know, I wanted to ask you, I know you have organized various events. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, that was actually a funny story. When I came back from Australia, I, that's when I went to the bank because I wanted to change, like have a bit of a different environment. As I said, yeah. my first job was Yann Krugier and yeah, just coming back to Geneva, there was nothing else. And my, Mr. Kujia did say come back and I just needed to do something different. I have to say as well that while I was in Australia, I kept in touch with the gallery and I would come back to Art Basel and do the fairs with them. That gave me also the opportunity to come home and visit my family. So I've always been in touch with Kujia. We even did an exhibition of Picasso prints in Melbourne, which was a, a good success as well. So like we were always in touch. So when I came back, he said, please come back. And I said, no, I wanted to do something else. So I worked in the bank and then the bank that I worked for was taken over. So again, he called me and says, come back. So I, I did go back to Galerie Cougier and this was in 2003. And we had signed up to do a show, which is, it's a contemporary art show called Art Moskva. Mm -hmm. And basically Mr. Cougier had not been back to the East. Uh, he's originally Polish but had not been back to the East since after the war. And so the Second World War. So he was very excited about going to Moscow and just had all this nostalgia going on. And um, I then saw an ad in the Geneva local newspaper to say that there was another show which was taking place a week after the one that we had enrolled for. And it seemed a lot more important as in modern work, not just so much that we were doing contemporary, but this was more mm -hmm. our league. So I went to see the guy who was organizing the show and, and he said, yeah, but we're full. Like, they had like 27 exhibitors. And I got, I mean, you're, when you work for Cougier, you're a bit pedantic. So I said, you know, I how bet. can <laughs> I bet. you organize a show and you don't come and see us, etc." And the guy said, okay, well, I see what I can do. And we got a third, uh, like, a, I don't know, I think we had like 35 square meters, which is nothing. We usually have 150 square meter stands. I said to Monsieur Cougier, look, we're already there. 
we might as well take a few, you know, just a few paintings, but we need to be in this other show as well. So we decided to do that. And while I was there, we then had to do, this was in May and we had to do Basel in mm-hmm. June. And uh, I, again, I met with the organizer of the fair and he said, why don't you come and um, work for me? And I said, well, you know, like, I, I don't know how to run an art fair. I've got no idea. And he says, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> so we, and I said, look, I'm, I mean, I'm, you know, like I'm representing one of your top galleries here and, and then I'm going to Art Basel. I really don't have time to think about this. And I wasn't really all that happy to be back at Kujis because I thought I'd sort of closed a loop and I wasn't ready to do that yet. So I was quite tempted by the this prospect, but I just thought, you know, I'm totally out of my comfort zone. Anyway, then I met the guy again and I started to work for him on the 1st of August. And that was how we started running the show. And we were we went from, that was 27 or 28 exhibitors. And the following year, there was 56. And then after that, we got up to 120. Yeah, to a made well, a medium size art fair. I mean, it wasn't anything like Art Basel or no, but that's I mean, that's substantial yeah, enough. It is substantial, I mean, that, and, and yeah. I can imagine a lot of work that went into it. You know, I'm going to change. I'm going to change the topic just a little bit here. You know, we've read about and learned that you designed the MBA program for the Geneva Business School. That sounds like a major mm-hmm. project, I must say, but I suspect it's been very rewarding for you. How did all that happen? Well, that's it's another good story. All my stories sort of link into one into the other. So um, that's your life's journey. After I uh, left, sixteen, that's yeah, your that's journey. your life's journey, and it's yes, the connectivity. obviously it's yeah. an exciting one. And you have, uh, as they like to say, no grass has grown under your feet. Not at all. Yeah, and I suppose I've always followed my my intuition, and I'm lucky enough that I've always done what I've wanted to do. But you were able to define what you want to do. So many people bounce around and float with different ideas and they never seem to coalesce any one. But you you went from one adventure to another. I mean, that's... And they all connected. The yeah. connectivity of everything that you're doing is so... It's a flawless and flowing. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose there's a focus with art, really. Yes. I mean, there's a, you know anything to do with culture and creativity I'm interested in and the rest I maybe maybe I just lock it out I don't know but anyhow with the MBA it's been a wonderful journey because I started um, so I did when the when I started at the bank I obviously had no idea this was when I came back from Australia about finance and banking so the the bank employed me basically for this art advice division that they wanted to create but I still had to have some basics about finance. So they sent me to a school called Geneva Business School. This was in 1999. And I did the course. And the deal was that if I pass, they will pay for the tuition. And then I owed them two years after that to work with them. And if I failed the course, I would have to pay for the tuition. Oh, So I passed and that was that. And then 10 years later, the school was just starting. It was a new school that was actually supported and, and sponsored by the Swiss Banking Association. And I think I was like the third intake. Anyway, and then 10 years later, they because I like to stay in touch with most of the people I meet, they asked me if I wanted to be a part of the 10th anniversary, as in the alumni and gather, you know, do a table or two at their celebration, which I did. And so that was 2009. And then that's it. I sort of left the school, but I stayed in friends with the owner of the school and in 2019, he asked me again because it was coming up to the 25th anniversary mm-hmm. or the 20th anniversary. And um, would I do the same thing? And I said, yeah, sure. And their celebrations were planned sort of in March 2020, which, of course, the whole world went into yes. lockdown. And so I had contacted the alumni and all that, but nothing happened in the end. And I said, by that time, they had also, for, for their own admin reasons, they had employed me. So I was quite happy because the culture side of things of the world, like I had no projects going or anything. So I was very fortunate and grateful to be employed. And um, I said, why don't we do something with the art? You guys do MBAs on sport management, on oil and gas management. on And basically, the art industry and the art market has been buoyant for 25 years so you could use that as a, as an anniversary synergy and you can um, and I'll get it all together for you so I started calling up on all my network and we decided on seven modules 
obviously we had to follow the educational side of things. There's lots of parameters. They've got, you know, it has to be equivalent and we have accreditation in the States and in Europe. You know, there's certain rules that you have to follow. Mm -hmm. So I worked very closely with the academics department and we decided on seven modules, which are history of art, art law, art finance, product entrepreneurship, like a gallery, event management, museology, and lo- and logistics. And then I got, I sort of started thinking, who are the top 10 in the world that, that do these, so, you know, that have these activities? And so I called them up. And um, I have to say 100% of the people I contacted followed me and, and said, yeah, sure, we'll teach. Of course, it's online and it's evening classes, so it allows both professors and students to keep on doing their professional activities. Was there was there art law involved in this? Yes, there is. It's the, There's a firm called La Lieve in Geneva. They actually founded the Art Law Foundation for the University of Geneva. And um, I have the lawyer Sandrine Giroux, who's designed the, the art law program. Oh, very impressive. It is very impressive. And then we've got um, Adriano Piccinati di Torcello. He works for Deloitte in Luxembourg, and he's been running the art sector for Deloitte for many, many years. And he writes the reports. He does all sorts of things. So he's going to be also one of our teachers. Uh, We've got Mark Restellini, who's got the uh, Restellini Institute for Forensics. He does, you know, lab studies on paintings, but he also wrote the catalogue resume for Amadeo Modigliani. Okay. Uh, You know, they're all very impressive people. So I'm really pleased. And it's given me the opportunity to rekindle with everybody. We've got Lorenzo Rudolph, who's supporting the project. He's the one who founded Art Basel Miami, and he was one of the founding members of Art Basel. I mean, we've got really, really top-notch professors. So I'm really pleased. Well, you're you're lucky. They were lucky to know you. So they had this opportunity. (laughs) This is a pretty exciting opportunity for them to share the knowledge that they've gained over their life's experiences. Yeah, I think we're all feeling the same thing. It's like a little bit of a loop. Like we've all, you know, we're all sort of of the 60s or a little bit younger, but we, you know, like all the expertise and experience that we've gained, we're sort of now sharing with these new students. I think the luckiest of the lot are the students, to be honest. I mean, (laughs) anybody that has the opportunity to go to the Geneva Business School and take advantage of this program. Yeah, because mm. there's such a force of, of, of yeah, you're just not going to get that instructors. anywhere. Instructors, oh my nowhere goodness. Else, there's nowhere else in the world that you would have that opportunity. Mm-mm. No. Yeah, honestly, I mean, it's without patting myself on the shoulder, but I did do some market research and I don't think there is another course quite as, A, quite as informal because it's going to be fun. And that's what I wanted. So all these people are active, but they're also super creative and and visionary. So, I mean, it's going to be exciting. Anyone who's interested in the art industry, even as a banker or as a lawyer, it doesn't matter. You know, it's going to be, they're going to meet all the right people and the networking is going to be tremendous. True, And then you'll also be helping your client by having a better understanding if they have, you know, a considerable art collection or any kind of collection, as you stated earlier. You're that way, to manage. Yes, you, you know how to manage and deal with it. Mm. Yeah, no, I think even we've had, I mean, I've had some really good applicants. Like uh, there's a guy in Germany, he's 40 years old. He's been in logistics and shipping all his life and he wants to specialize in art. And he's signed up to the course. I just think that's wonderful. That is wonderful. Well, logistics are a critical part of moving art around the world. It is. Yeah. So yeah, you would of have course. some understanding there. It is. Now I'm going to ask you about something a little bit different and it's the Red Pencil Project. Tell us about your involvement mm-hmm. in that and what, what that is. Well, that's been something that was is very close to my heart. I'm no longer on the board due to lack of mm-hmm. time, unfortunately, but I follow them closely. The Red Pencil was founded by a Belgium lady who's an art therapist in Singapore, but she's now back in Belgium. Uh, her name is Laurence Vandenberg. And she created a pool of art of qualified art therapists throughout the world who donate up to three weeks of their time on a, on a cause. And the, the, the red pencil operates in a, anywhere in the world where there's extreme poverty or a pandemic right, right now yeah. it's worldwide, but I mean, where the, you know, or there's been a, a war disaster or, um, or anything like it, 
an earthquake or whatever, natural disaster. And so they go there and it's a three-phase program. They go there as the emergency and they stay about 10 days and they suss out. They usually, we started out by working with the children only in those areas when there was a tsunami in, in the Philippines, yes. um, only because we, we felt that the children were the most lost because all the adults and the guys from the Red Cross and everything who are doing wonderful jobs that they're busy and they're not really taking care of the children. And very often the children have lost their mom or their grandma or their home or whatever, and they're just left there. So the red pencil moved in and started taking care of the children. And then when we got to Lebanon one year, we were in a refugee camp and we found that the mothers would not let the children come to us because, you know, everybody was super frightened. Mm -hmm. So then we started to include the mothers and the sisters, etc. And now it's the red pencil is really open to everyone. And they do great jobs. They they work in India. They work in something like, I don't know, 100 countries, 122 countries mm -hmm. in the world. And um, obviously they work with donations. But um, a lot of it is just, um, you know, like people being volunteers. And it, it's it's unbelievably successful. As, as in it really helps. Art therapy is great. I can see why you'd be passionate about Absolutely, that. Absolutely, yes. That's a, a marvelous thing. And also so like so meaningful for people that really are vulnerable. Yeah, it's, it gives children, especially children, an opportunity to kind of refocus their thinking. When you're sitting there drawing or sketching or playing with crayons or whatever, all of a sudden you're not thinking about what's going on around yeah, you so much and it's trauma. refocusing your thinking. That's a, a, a wonderful project. And there's also like the saying is, you know, when you've got when you've got no words left to say what you've just been going, we you know what you're going yes. through. You can do it in color and in drawing. And so the red pencil then goes back three months later and another time. So they go back three times to and the second time it's to follow up and to see how the people are doing. And the third time it teaches people how to use the tools and, and what to make of it themselves so that we don't need to go back because people know how to use the, you know, the, the functions of, of art therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can be art, but it can also be arts with an S. It can be music, it can be dance. We've had, in Nepal, we've had a lot of young women do story cloth, like where they sew patchworks of what goes mm. on. Oh, yes. It really, really good. It's really interesting. I'm going to have to move on a little bit here because you're so yeah. fascinating to talk to and we're learning so much and we're very excited to learn about the Red Pencil Project. But, you know, throughout your career, you touched on this a little bit earlier, you've been very passionate about art and creativity. Is there one driving force that you think is mm -hmm. behind that? I just think I'm very curious and I, I like... I like beauty, but not as in decorative beauty. I like, th you know, storytelling or even if it's a violent message. Or I just like the way communicating through the image, I think. And so I'm interested in all of that. I'm interested in street art. I'm interested in the, you know, in, if somebody is suffering, to, that it comes out in that way. And that, and I'm always curious, wherever I travel, I'll go to the gallery or the museum. And I don't know why. Maybe it's in the DNA. My grandfather was also an artist. I've had, yeah, he was in the watch industry, but he was uh, an enamelist. So, you know, a very good draftsman. So maybe it's in the DNA. I have no well, idea. You know, I'm going to ask you a kind of a follow up on that one, too. In five words or less, what would be your advice to people that want to live or be more creative in their lives? Yeah. I mean, you certainly have managed that. Do you have a, a recommendation for others? Five words isn't much, but um, <laughs> take all you need. Yeah. We're generous today. Today we're giving away extra, extra words. Extra words. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think what's important is also not to renege on the past. Like, I mean, if you're interested in art, learn your history of art and learn it over and over again and go through it. Go to museums and go to gallery shows and whether it's, you know, traditional art or whether it's contemporary art or whether it's kinetic or now digital but just go and see art and go and look at it and, and just immerse yourself and be curious. So that's two. 
Then I say remain open-minded. Like whenever you go somewhere, don't ever sort of say, you know, oh, this ain't art. And everything is, is, has potential. And so just be open-minded. Yeah, and, and our, our show and then, is based on celebrating what people love to do creatively. And you are a great example of celebrating what people love to do creatively, uh, not only for yourself, yeah. but you've surrounded yourself with very creative people. That's mm-hmm. very admirable and kind of exciting. I think it's exciting. And I, I have to tell you something when I speak, like if I meet new people and um, it's happened a little bit when I was working with the MBA, because I have to say all this academics and educational and, you know, they wanted people who had done research and whatever. And it was a little bit of a dry, sometimes dry exchange. And then I'd call up someone to ask them if they wanted to be a professor for the art, for the MBA. And like immediately the conversation flows. So as I said earlier, sometimes I just seem to, like if you don't interest me, I just shut you mm-hmm. off. Yeah. And <laughs> well, thank you for being on our podcast. Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but um, yeah, and then I'd say work, 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 work hard like, and believe in yourself. And that goes for anything, not just being creative. But uh, I think if you believe in yourself and you work hard, you're going to be creative, whether you're going to be a scientist or an artist. Uh, that's very good advice. That's very good advice, for yeah. sure. And now, mm-hmm. Angie. Yes, yeah, so we're going to now ask you the question we ask all of our podcast guests, and it, their answers are always fascinating. So if you could sit on a park bench and chat with anyone from the past, who would it be? Wow. Okay. I'll start by saying I went to a party once in Darwin, and they said, come as your favorite dead person. And I went as Andy Warhol. Oh. And had a, uh, I had a Campbell's soup can on a t-shirt and I had a blonde wig, which I put on and sit down tight. Nobody knew who I was. Oh. So I was really upset. <laughs> That's pretty wild. But no, if I had today, to be honest, and it's going to be very personal, but I have my grandmother's grandmother in Germany, who was born in 1831, was an actress on the stage in Dresden and Berlin. And as I understand it, she was a little bit of a strong personality. She had a very loud voice, which she actually, I think in the early 20th century, she flew to New York to be recorded because that was the only recording studio that, that uh, she, you know, where she could record her Mm -hmm. own voice. She was, she, she even took photographs in those days. So, I mean, she was not only was she a strong woman, but I, I imagine she loved gadgets and anything that was novel. And she ran a salon or a, like a boudoir in, in Dresden. And she met people like Richard Wagner. She, you know, and she held diaries. And so I've read those diaries and I've researched a little bit about her. So I think if I met her on a, on a bench park, I'd love to talk to her. I could see why. What a vibrant woman. She had so much going on. Yeah. I also think she was a bit of a floozy because um, <laughs> she, she knew many more men than she did women in her entourage. But um, That's what made her interesting and that's that how she educated herself. Probably. But also back then, I think that women were mostly just in the home. They weren't doing so many things and being so vibrant like your great grandmother. And so maybe the men were more yeah. fascinating at the yeah, time. Yeah, they were more fascinating. They were more interesting because yeah. other women wouldn't have been as interesting to her. I mean, look at George Sand, right? Exactly. George Sand. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And Colette. Yeah, and, Colette. Uh, and they dressed up as men actually to be, to be recognized, right. right? They thought, and they also said, like, I think it was George Sand said, I dress up like a man because I have more fun when I'm a man. Yeah, probably. <laughs> she so, certainly had more interesting mm, conversations. True for back then. That is so true. Yeah. So, yeah, so I think kudos to my, uh, her name was Paulina Ulrich. And uh, she, uh, yeah, I think she must have been a fantastic person. Probably not very easy to get on with because she probably had a strong mind. But yeah, she must have been fascinating. Well, maybe you have some of that DNA in you. Yes. Yeah, that would be nice. I'd be very honored if somebody recognized that. It, they In um, 2016, they celebrated in Dresden the 100th anniversary of her death. And uh they named the, um, there's a square in front of the theater in Dresden, in the old Dresden, which was totally rebuilt by UNESCO because mm-hmm. it was bombed during the Second World War. And um, so they now there's a square, Paulina Ulrich. And uh, I was there, I was invited and as you know, with my other family members. And some guys said I looked like uh, her, but I mean, I don't see it. I don't oh, see it. Wow. But anyway. That's interesting. I though. thought they would say you look more like Andy Warhol. 
<laughs> yeah, I would have preferred that maybe a little bit more crazy in the factory there, but no. no. <laughs> well, you know, you're fascinating to talk to. Absolutely. And I know our listeners are going to really enjoy hearing our interview with you. Both Angie and I are really thankful that you've taken the time to speak with yes. us. Oh, it was a pleasure. I loved it. And I'm I'm really happy that you contacted me. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Yes. Thank you so much for being with us. And I agree with Rod. And if our listeners would like to know more about you, 16, we will have links for her under our show guest tab at our website at thoughtrowpodcast.com. So everyone can learn more about her and please connect with her on social media and check out her website. Yeah, and definitely do. As, as our dedicated listeners, this is somebody you should really check out and learn to learn to know more about 16 and that MBA program if you're interested. Yeah. Uh, there's a, that's, that's quite impressive what you've managed to accomplish there. We're excited for you. Thank you very much. And everyone's welcome to contact me at any time. Okay, okay. well, they'll have all of your info, so they'll yes, reach out to you. Definitely. But thank you again. This yes, has 16, been, this thank has been you. wonderful. All right, goodbye. Have a nice day. Thank you, you too. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm really glad you tuned in today. We hope you enjoyed the thoughts and ideas we shared with you. We post a new podcast every week, so remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss an episode. So it's bye for now from my husband Rod and I, wishing everyone a great day.